Hello and welcome to this episode of Shim on Ops. My name is Shimon Toltz and today we have a very interesting session about developing tools for Kubernetes. So we have Roy Sahari who's going to talk to us about how they built a platform to help engineers develop applications on top of Kubernetes from Raft. Let's get started. Hey, Rui, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming. So, you know, I'm a, a bit of a Kubernetes geek. I love CNCF. I love Kubernetes. And as a CNCF ambassador, I get to check out a lot of tools and to, yeah. to be around this area. So I'm very, very glad for you to coming on the show today. So would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, cool. So, uh, so I'm Roy. It's actually Yarchi, uh, not Zachary. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but a good try. <laughs> uh, so uh, I started my professional journey in the IDF Intelligence, Co Intelligence Corp, uh, joined SkyQ uh, when I left as one of the first developers. Uh, first developers, and later on, I was leading uh, one of the uh, first R&D teams there, then uh, R&D groups, uh, research group, lots of, uh, lots of other uh, uh, things in this area. And uh, then uh, we got acquired by Symantec. I've been there for a while. And I think that's... Uh, that's about this. Uh, was geek uh, all, uh, can uh, from the time I can uh, remember myself. Was always a uh, geek. Was really passionate about uh, anything computers and specifically developing. So uh, yeah, amazing. <laughs> so br what brought you to this Kubernetes journey? You know, <laughs> how did you end up here? Yeah, so I think that uh, it's even uh, it starts uh, earlier than this. Uh, looking on development, uh, we saw the development environment was something that's always been uh, painful for developers. Mm. Uh, just being able to run your code and do the day-to-day -day job without, uh, without the environment gets in the way was always a pain. From, uh, from setting it up to uh, then um, on and off needs to, uh, to keep uh, babysitting it so it con continues uh, working. So that's, uh, that's something that we saw uh, all along the way. And I saw it as a developer myself. And uh, lots of uh, people in my team uh, were, were facing a lot of issues. Once we moved to, uh, to a more microservices uh, world and Kubernetes is uh, the champ there, uh, we saw that the, the, uh, the issues were changed. It's now much easier to define how you need to run your, uh, your environment, how you need to run your code. We have containers and Kubernetes just for this. Uh, but then it became much, much harder to work on it as a developer. Doing very quick iterations, it kind of became just uh, painful. Uh, as a developer, you need to continuously rebuilding images, redeploying them. It just takes a very, very long time. And we lost the uh, ability to introspect with uh, debugging tools and so on. So uh, This is so interesting because like we went to this path because we wanted to avoid the works on my machine phenomena. And then we went into like containers and then we went to like those crazy orchestrators. And now for it to work on your machine, you actually need to bring a <laughs> Kubernetes on your machine. So then it will like work on your machine. So yeah, I guess I, yeah. I, I get it. Like it's harder for every developer. Yeah. Like like every developer needs to, in a way, be like a, a, a Kubernetes expert, a DevOps engineer. Yeah. And then you work with uh, with ARM-based machine, and it's completely different than what, you, what you're doing in uh, in production. So you get to the same issue uh, again, again. Actually, it happened to me like uh, two days ago, where I was uh, building and like Docker build X, and you need to specify the the platform because you go like, didn't Docker? Like, it was supposed to solve the issue of like interoperability, you know? And now like, <laughs> no, you need to compile it either for ARM or for AMD sixty four. But then you have Wasm containers. Wait for my next video about it, but which oh, solved this okay. problem, by the way. Awesome. Um, okay, so so I get it. So you know, debugging and uh, just managing environments as a developer in a Kubernetes-driven world is hard. So so what are the solutions today? You know, before Raft, like what was what were people doing? Mm -hmm. So lots of it is, uh, is building tools uh, uh, internally. What we see lots of companies do is to build uh, orchestration uh, abilities in-house. So you can use Terraform, you can use uh, Kubernetes, uh, tools like uh, uh, 
uh, Argo CD or Flux to bring up environment uh, on demand or family environment. Very, very cool, uh, cool tools. And there are also commercial uh, uh, offerings to have it more uh, managed that lets you uh, to bring up environment for, for anything you want. It can be staging, production, or even for, uh, for developers even working on specific branches. But what it got uh, is that uh, now you have a very cool CI-CD operation that from a uh, Git push created a new environment or updates it, but now you have a very, very long uh, time since you wrote a line of code until you get it uh, in, in your environment, in your dev environment. It can so like be- in a scenario, like you have to actually champion it through the entire CI-CD pipeline yeah. until it gets to dev. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so it takes like five to 10 minutes is the bare minimum. And you see uh, companies work with uh, half an hour or even more for, for each iteration, which is really, really painful. Uh, we see other, uh, other things in the space, like uh, companies working on orchestration uh, capabilities or uh, solutions like uh, GitHub code space, if you uh, heard about it, that works in a bit uh, of a different way. They don't look at uh, and on Kubernetes or containers as the thing that they need to solve, but rather on having your machine abstracted in the cloud, which is great to have a way to spin up machines in the cloud with a similar configuration, but this then does not really uh, uh, help you to run your code in Kubernetes and iterate very, very efficiently. So look, if we think about it, so basically, like I write my code, let's say I write Node.js, and yeah. then uh, I like I, I have like the npm dev, right? And I build it locally. But then I do a, like a Docker build, and we have the problem of the ARM and AMD, whatever. And then I want to see how it works with the Kubernetes because maybe my app actually works with internal Kubernetes uh, resources, or it uh, talks to other microservices through RPG or something like that. RPC, sorry. And then. What happens is that, like, I need to have my own local, let's say, a mini dev environment on my laptop, right? So I know that what companies do today is either like they do a Docker Compose in a way, mm -hmm. but then it's also becoming complicated because sometimes you also use cloud services. So let's say you're using AWS and SQS or or a queue or something like that. So it becomes kind of challenging orchestrating this entire environment on your laptop. Yeah. So so yeah. how did you think about like solving this today? Like, like what do you think is the right approach? So should mm -hmm. every environment, should every developer have its own environment in the cloud, which by the way, I know companies that do it to the point where every developer has its own AWS account. Mm -hmm. um, or do you think there should be shared dev environments or should it be easy for every developer to run the entire development on their laptop? What is your approach? Yeah. So my approach is that every developer should have his own development environment. This is the best way to run as fast as you can and to have environment that is as similar to production as you can get because it's really, it has, it has all the, the resources that it needs. It runs the same way as you run production. This is the best way to, uh, to work very, very efficiently. Working locally with Kubernetes is great, but you get to a certain point in which you just uh, you just can't run all of the services locally, or you don't have a good uh, replacement to other things that you have in the cloud, whether it's uh, uh, SQS or other uh, AWS uh, uh, things that you just need for your environment. DynamoDB, whatever, yeah. Yeah, DynamoDB, anything else yes, that you can think of. Um, and having shared environments is something that we see uh, that works fine for, for some companies, but it creates a lot of, lot of friction. To, to do it really good and give a very good separation on top of the same environment is very, very hard uh, challenge. And to do environments that are shared and some people just replace part of the, of the things in them is something that we, we do support, but we really discourage people from doing because it creates a lot of mess. You don't know if, uh, if something doesn't work because it's issue in your code, or maybe someone else messed with the environment, <laughs> and now you need to uh, to uh, figure it out. So you waste a lot of time. Okay, so I understand the landscape. So, what what is your unique solution to the problem? Like, what is your maybe tell me what is tell me a little bit about the company first, the background, and then take me to the solution. Cool. Uh, so the company is uh, Rast, as you know, 
Um, we are today at 12 people overall, uh, raised $5 million uh, to date in a seed round and starting selling our product in the last uh, co- uh, quarter or so. And uh, we today have uh, uh, our few uh, first customer, uh, paying customers, and you see them uh, from very wide variety. Some of them are small startups, some are uh, enterprise companies. It's really something that fits uh, a lot of different companies. So that, that's something that we really uh, love in the solution. Um, and uh, looking at the space and what we are doing, we are really, really laser focused on making the best, uh, the best um, developer experience uh, that we can get. You can see it uh, looking on our, our configuration, which is uh, Python-like. Uh, so you can do lots of things very, very easily. And you can see it with how our product works. So we do not have a web interface today. We have a very good CLI tool, and we have a great IDE plugin for uh, JetBrains or uh, OVS Code. You have no dashboard? How are people logging in? <laughs> <laughs> no dashboard. You don't need to. Uh, tell me, to log tell me how do I log in? I want to see how do I log in. If you have no dashboard, so first time you do a uh, Raft Connect, I, I won't uh, be able to show it here because I'm already uh, logged okay. in. Okay. The first time you run a uh, you run the command that you want, whether it's Raft App to orchestrate environment or Raft Connect to uh, to connect to existing environment, what will happen is that Raft will see that you do not have a, a user currently and we'll uh, use your, your uh, preferred OAuth uh, to, do it, uh, to do it for us. So it can be a uh, Google, Microsoft, or even GitHub, or uh, Bitbucket, GitLab, whatever you use, will uh, we'll let you uh, do it. And then it will just start uh, running everything. So you do not need a special Raft user or anything like nice. that. Nice. So, so initially, like I brew install Raft or whatever, or curl yeah. it from the internet, it's like a Go binary or something like it's that? It's a Go binary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, yeah. so so what can it do? Show me. What what is your approach to to this issue? So we want to be as agnostic as we can to the to how people like likes to orchestrate environments. And uh, so if you have Argo CD or Flux or anything else that you use to orchestrate environments, we want to be able to connect with with this environment without needing to change worlds and uh, and uh, having the devs do lots of work just to be able to use Raft. Um, uh, but if you do not have an orchestration solution, you can use Raft to orchestrate. So what I'm doing the demo now is to show how it looks when you do have a way to orchestrate environment. I just use a Helm install before, uh, before starting this demo to install the environment. And we can see the, the names that I created in the right side here using uh, K9S. I and love so- K9S. It's a great tool. Yeah, yeah, I really like it. And uh, so the first thing that I will do is to use Raft Connect. What will happen now is that Raft will create our environment controller in the, in the same namespace. This is our leg in the remote environment. And what it will uh, let us do is to, uh, to be able to connect to the environment, see what's, uh, what's in there, and then let us convert services to dev mode. So you can see that now it's deployed here, started to initialize uh, some uh, thinking operations. So later on, code sync will be very, very fast. And then we can see the environment here. So you can see all of the services. We have 11 workloads here. We're using the online boutique demo uh, that uh, Google developed, and uh, the, the uh, microservices demo. And so you can see that we have the, the workloads here, but none of them is in dev mode. To convert something to dev mode, what I want to do is to use the Raft dev command and then uh, give the, the name of the, uh, the workload. And what we can see now in the right side here is that Raft will now replace the, the workload with a Raftified version of it. And uh, this now... Interesting. Is, uh, How does it do it? So it's, it takes the definition from the, uh, from the Kubernetes deployment itself and then do slight modifications. Part of it is wrapping it with some, uh, uh, some of the uh, Raft magic that actually splits the life cycle of the container between the process and the container itself. It means that with Raft, if your process crashes, you can still connect to the container and do lots of investigation to understand what happened there. Or you can even replace the process uh, all along and I'll show uh, what it lets us do uh, in a few seconds. Um, cool. Okay, that's when, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so once I have this, and we can go to, the, to IntelliJ and to see how the end definition is, uh, is actually, uh, how, it, how it actually looks. 
So you can see that we are taking the namespace resources in this case, and then we are doing very slight modifications. So for example, for the recommendation service and uh, deployment, all I had to do is to mount my code. This is the Python service. All I had to do is just to mount uh, my code to the remote machine, to the remote uh, container. And now every change that I do locally will be reflected there uh, immediately. And um, you can see that we can uh, map ports locally if you want local host port to be uh, accessible, to, to let you access something that is running in the environment. Maybe you have DB or just your front end, as we see here. Um, so and every time I make a code change to my code, it will automatically be reflected in my dev Kubernetes in the cloud? Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, so that's it, cool. In a minute, yeah. Cool. Uh, so let's find something to uh, uh, to do here. So if we go to Chrome, you can see uh, that this is the environment. Uh, I'm accessing it through the ingress currently. So nothing uh, nothing changed in how I can access the environment. And uh, as I said, this is the online boutique demo that my uh, that uh, Google developed. And this will get you into into one of the items here. Uh, you can see that we have a recommendation system here. But obviously, something is broken. We have the uh, salt and paper shakers, and uh, they get uh, offered to us uh, like four times, which I believe that this is a really great product. But uh, probably, as the shop owner, I want to be more subtle and maybe uh, show them just as one of the options. Um, so that's a. <laughs> not sure what happened, but uh, we have an uh, echo now. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. So uh, going back to the to the ID, if we'll go to the code, what we can see is that we can easily spot this uh, bug in this, uh, in this case. It's in line 78. We can see that we are using the zero index instead of going and using the I index in this uh, list comprehension. And so fixing it can now trigger the live reload in RAF. Or I can also click this button, the restart process. What it will do is to restart the remote process. So no need to, uh, to redeploy. No. Salt and paper and pepper. Yeah, so now it's still here, but uh, we can see some other uh, very cool items. Uh, and so we do it with uh, with any language. In this case, it's just uh, it's very very simple. Uh, you can uh, sync the code, restart the process. No need to build the uh, the binary. We do support lots of other uh, languages such as Go, .NET, uh, Node, and um, Java. Whatever you want to use, uh, we probably uh, support it. Uh, so, and so, so just just so understand. So, if I did not have raft, I would have changed this instead of like position zero to I, yeah. and then I had to like save git commit, git push, a CI CD process would have to run, build a container, push it to my registry, Argo CD should have like seen that there is a change, trigger a deployment, and only then I would have been able to actually see what I changed. That's true. Yeah. Wow. And if you had any issue, uh, you probably just do the, just add a bunch of logs to try to uh, to see where it is because maybe it's not such a clear issue as we saw here. So what you do is just add a bunch of logs and then wait uh, this uh, half an hour to have it uh, redeploy, look through the logs, hopefully finding it. Uh, with Raft, you can just click the debug button, uh, the blue one here. And what Raft is doing now is to spin up the debugging session with the remote uh, Kubernetes cluster with the container that is running there. So if we do something like uh, refreshing the page, we can see that I'm now just debugging something live. And so we can see wow. the product list. I can uh, do things like uh, maybe you want to change it to only return one item. Let's see how this, uh, this will look. And uh, so now we have this uh, salt and paper shakers again, but now it's only one. Uh, wow, it's really, really fast. Yeah, our goal is to make it so it would be as fast as working locally and with, with something running locally and running it from your ID. We want, we want you to have the same experience. So you do, not lose, uh, you do not lose anything when working with remote environments. In this case, I'm using an EKS cluster in Frankfurt. So uh, there is some latency there, but you don't see it. It's not something that you can... No, uh, I... And Amazing. Cool. So that's a, that's a very, very quick demo. You can do lots with our plugin. So I just show you how you can uh, replace the process, but you can also uh, say, like, maybe I want to, uh, to do something with the shipping cost here. So let's uh, change this one to, uh, to dev mode. 
it will see it now uh, redeploying here in the background. You can see logs or, uh, or just uh, connect the terminal for any one of the services that you have. So uh, you do not need to be a Kubernetes expert to work your, with your Kubernetes environment. If you, even if you did not convert something to dev mode, but you just want to see it logs, you can, see, you can uh, do it uh, right away. And as I said, you can work with, uh, with Go binaries and do uh, lots of things. So if I want to, so, to uh, for example, uh, change how, uh, oh, let uh, just run it. Uh, if I want to change, for example, how, uh, how the shipping calculation works, you can see it now it's uh, $899. Let's add uh, 10 more items. It will be the same. I can just go to the shipping codes. It will be uh, here. And let's uh, change it to be something that is uh, taking into consideration the number of items I have in my cart. Just change the, uh, the configuration to be the shipping one. Click the debug. And this time, it's Go code. So what we'll see is that we are rebuilding the binary, the remote mm -hmm. binary. You can also define it to, uh, to do it in the background. When you change the code, it can rebuild it and restart the process uh, by itself. You can also trigger it by uh, clicking the run or debug buttons. And once we have this, we can just refresh it, and you can see that the shipping cost uh, changes. I see. The so, goal is so... to be able to do it pretty really fast. Amazing. So, so basically, so I as a as a user, so you support like VS Code, IntelliJ. I just install a, an add-on on my ID. Mm -hmm. I log in into the uh, I log in into my account, and then uh, after I install it on my dev cluster, then I'm able to to work with with my cluster and debug my code. So you don't necessarily need to uh, even install something in your cluster if you have a namespace that you have. Uh, access to it, uh, Kubernetes uh, level access from your local kubectl, Rust can use it to give you the same experience. So you just use Rust Connect. We'll do anything without you need to, uh, to do any setup on the, on the remote uh, Kubernetes cluster. You can uh, install our cluster manager if you want to do orchestration or you want, uh, or you want to be able to, uh, to give people access to the environment without needing to give them uh, Kubernetes level access. So they can get the access from Rust uh, without needing uh, any QCTL uh, direct access. That is very interesting. And, and do you position yourself as mainly on the dev side, or you also see yourself deployed in production in your customers' workload for them to troubleshoot production issues? It's really, really uh, focused on developers. Uh, so that's, that's the goal there, to make it really efficient for you. You can use Raft uh, to, uh, uh, to, and install it on uh, production because it's really easy. Just you yeah. Raft Connect and it will work. We don't, uh, we don't encourage this uh, today, but uh, I won't stop you. Amazing. So how much does it cost? So Raft is, uh, we have a free, uh, free offering for uh, up to three developers per company. You can use it just for free uh, with all of the features included. Then it really depends on, the, on how you install Raft and the, and the support. But it's usually tens of uh, dollars per, uh, per developer per month. So, ah, so it's priced by the amount of developers you have. Yeah, it's a, it's five per uh, per developer. We don't care how many developers you are debugging in parallel. Uh, you can do whatever you want, uh, just per seat. Amazing! And if people want to get started, how can they do it? Is it self service? Yeah. So the best way would be to go to our website, and in the in our website we have uh, right now it uh, it will redirect you to our documentation that have both uh, the same tutorial, same demo that I did now. You can do it uh, by yourself and also instructions to how you can onboard your project to Rust, uh, which is usually like a few, uh, few minutes. So, uh, very quick. Amazing. Very, very cool, Roy. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for hosting me. It was great.